The second thing we need is the table controller to provide the HTTP front end to your DTO. If you've done work in ASP.NET MVC, then this is going to be very familiar to you because the process is the same. This is a standard ASP.NET MVC controller type. The easiest way to add one to your project is to use the Add Controller menu option. Just select Azure Mobile Apps Table Controller from the dialog. Then you can set the name of the controller, select the DTO that it's going to manage, and also select the database context to add the DB set to. This will create a new table controller class that's tied to your selected DTO and add the DB accessor code to the mobile DB context class so that you can read and write the DTO from the table. The second thing that we need is the table controller. This is a custom class that derives from table controller of type T. And T is going to be the data transfer object or the entity definition. Table controller is a built-in class that provides methods to perform operations against the associated DTO table. And it acts as a web API controller mapped to a route. Using the table controller base class provides two benefits over just using the plain API controller. This conforms to the OData version 3 specification which allows basic filtering and a standardized REST interface to a database. It also implements the internal logic for offline synchronization. As you can see, there are several methods defined on this class. Let's take a look at some of them. The initialize method is called for each inbound HTTP request, and it has to do two things. First, it's going to create a mobile service context, which will be used to query the data. This is really just an entity framework DB context. And second, it needs to create and assign the domain manager object. The Entity Domain Manager of Type T is a class that implements the required iDomainManager interface. The domain managers are primarily intended for mapping the table controller CRUD, create, read, update, and delete, to a backend. Each table controller has its own domain manager. Again, it's going to implement the iDomainManager interface. The iDomainManager maps and implements all the table controller CRUD operations for the backend database. Next, the table controller has a set of HTTP action routes defined. And these are mapped by ASP.NET MVC to the HTTP verbs. The first operation, which is generally present, is the get query. Since the method name starts with get, this is going to be mapped to an HTTP get operation. And this method returns a base class method that does basically a select star query on the database. It's returned as an iQueryable, which is then turned into a JSON collection once ASP.NET builds the returning request. The next method is a post operation, which is used to create a new to-do item in this case. This is an insert into the database. Notice that it does the insert using an asynchronous base class method. Then it creates a new URL, which maps to the current table with the unique generated ID at the end. This is returned to the client to identify the generated DB record by a unique URL. And finally, we have the delete operation. This is a call to the async base class method that deletes the record by ID. And the code that you see here is a fully functioning service minus the update action. The primary goal is to map the HTTP operations to specific database operations for the given entity or DTO mapping. But you can add your own logic into these methods as well. That's the benefit of the ASP.NET MVC approach. It's really easy to customize the logic for both the service and the database being exposed. By default, you must use a prefix on each method that's going to respond to an HTTP verb. When a network request hits the controller endpoint, the proper method is going to be identified using reflection by matching to this prefix. If you'd like to change the names of the methods or be more explicit about how the verbs are mapped to the methods, you can use a set of attributes that you apply to the methods. Now, delete is an interesting operation when you're dealing with cloud-based databases. It's destructive, which means it removes records from the shared data source, which of course can then affect other clients that are trying to work with this data. And as such, it needs to be treated specially to ensure that it is propagated down to each client. And there's two ways to deal with this, and Azure supports, supports both approaches. First, you could just delete the record and then report errors to any clients who think the record is still there. Or second, you could use a soft delete model where records are never actually deleted, but instead they have this notation to indicate that they're no longer present. When soft delete is turned on, delete operations done through NAD framework will actually set a deleted flag on the row to indicate whether the specified row is deleted or available. The queries will automatically include a where clause to filter out the deleted requests. This is added automatically by the table controller. Now, regardless of whether a soft delete is turned on, every exposed table always has a deleted flag. It's just simply not used if soft delete is disabled. And soft delete is a common solution to synchronizing different clients against the shared database. However, it's not always required. Keep in mind that this is a server side decision. The client cannot opt in or opt out of soft delete. It's either on or off based on the server table configuration. Whether you decide to use it or not, 
depends on a couple of factors. First, if you plan to support offline data access and synchronization, which is a built-in feature of the Azure client, then you definitely want to have this feature turned on. It reduces the number of sync errors that you're going to encounter. Second, if you need to audit deletes or support the ability to restore deleted records, then this feature is going to be perfect for your business needs. However, if none of these apply to you, then soft delete might just be overhead that you don't need. It makes the database larger because records are never deleted. The ID column cannot be reused and it has to be a string type, which is the default anyway. And you are probably going to need a server side function to periodically clear those deleted records. To activate the soft delete support, you must pass a flag to your entity domain manager of type T class, which is part of your initialize method in your table controller. You must pass a true flag as part of the constructor. And this has to be done on each table controller that needs to support soft delete. Now we've been focusing mostly on exposing data tables from our service, but you can also expose basic APIs by deriving from the Web API base class API controller. This works the same way as the table controller, but it doesn't supply any database connection. You can name the methods, get, post, put, or you could use attributes as you see here. The one thing you should be sure to do is add the mobile app controller attribute. This attribute registers the route, sets up the JSON serializer for all the methods, and turns on the client version checking. Any controller that does not have the mobile app controller attribute applied can still be accessed by clients, but it may not be correctly consumed by the clients using the mobile app client SDK methods. So you have to do it through the raw HTTP client or some other REST-based client code. The table controller of type T derived classes don't need to have this attribute because it's applied on the base table controller class. Thank you.